So now that we've looked at the water conducting cell side of the plant cell story, we're going to continue looking at these conductive cells by entitling this next flowchart, plant cells 5. And here what we're going to be looking at is, of course, differentiated cells. I have to get that out of the way. Spells, uh, cells, I should say, that are very specialized in what they do. And how are they specialized? What is their specialization that we're focusing on? Well, that specialization is the fact that these are going to be sugar-conducting, sugar-moving, sugar-transporting cells of the phloem. Okay, so now we're moving in terms of our vascular tissue, the type of vascular tissue. Now we're looking at the phloem, sugar-conducting cells here. So there are two major types that we want to look at. The first type is known as a sieve tube element. So what are these STEs as I like to call them? First of all, are they alive or dead at maturity? Here they are alive at maturity and something that I suggest is labeling out all the ones that are alive in one page, labeling out all the ones that are dead at one page just so that you can clearly see the distinction between alive and dead plant cells. So these are alive at maturity but interestingly they really are very much this most simplified form of cell that you can imagine. I like to think of these as the ver their version of a red blood cell because these cells actually have no nucleus, just like our red blood cells. They have no mitochondria, M-I-T-O for mitochondria, just like our red blood cells. They have no ribosomes. They have no large vacuole. That's something that many plant cells have that holds water. That large vacuole is something sometimes called the tonoplast. It has none of these, so no nucleus, mito, ribo, large vacuole. And that's weird. Why doesn't it have these very important life, you know, life harboring functional organelles? And we'll see why in just a second. So, in addition, C2 elements are going to be elongated. That's a big thing. We've been seeing this many times over. So another thing I would label out, those that are elongated and those are, that are short in terms of plant cells. Now, sieve tube elements are going to be found at the ends of walls, okay? At the ends of the cell walls of plants. So at the ends of the walls, what we're going to be seeing is the following. We're going to be seeing sieve plates. So we see sieve plates. And a sieve is a filter, okay? And sieve plates are going to be there with pores. These pores are essentially going to be the drainers of these cells. They're going to drain something very important. And that draining will be the draining of sugar. Sugar has to move from cell to cell to cell. So what you're going to do is you're going to use a sieve tube element to drain out just the specific sugar that you want. Now, this is not as easy as I just said because we're going to have the help of something known as companion cells, but we'll get to that in just a second. Now, in terms of the functionality, when we see sieve, sieve tube elements, we're going to see them often stacked end to end. This is, of course, to maximize efficiency, to have them right next to each other. When they're next to each other like this, end to end, they're going to form a sieve tube. So a bunch of sieve tube elements will form a sieve tube. Once you have a sieve tube, from here you're going to now basically have a continuous, well-flowing cytoplasm. Because right now you don't have any organelles in the way. No nucleus, mitochondria, ribosomes, large vacuole, nothing big is in the way. Because right now what's going to happen is just the cytoplasm is going to continuous, continuously extend. So there's going to be continuous cytoplasmic extension from cell to cell, from sieve tube to sieve tube, in other words, from cell to cell. And how is that extension going to be mediated? That's going to be via these sieve plates, okay? Via sieve plates. Those sieve plates will be the drainers and they connect cell to cell to give you a continuous overall cytoplasm. What's the purpose of all this? Well, the purpose of all this is the following. The dissolved sugar, the glucose that has, needs to be transported throughout the cell, usually from the leaf to everywhere else, is going to be transported long distances successfully because we have this nice continuous arrangement of cells that makes it very easy for the phloem to do its job of conduction. Okay, So the dissolved sugar transported 
over long distances. Because sometimes you have to go from the leaf all the way down to the ground, to the root. And that's going to be successfully happening because of sieve tube elements. Dissolved sugar transported. Let me finish this. Long distances. Now, in addition to the sieve tube elements, these guys are not going to be able to do this on their own. They're actually going to need the help of a companion, of a friend. And that companion is very nicely named the companion cells. That's exactly what they're called, believe it or not. So companion cells are also sugar-conducting cells, but they're technically not sugar-conducting cells, as we'll see in just a second. Now, first and foremost, alive or dead, they are alive at maturity. These companion cells. They are always next to sieve tube elements. That's their job. They're friends of sieve tube elements. So always next to S-T-E for right there, sieve tube elements. They're going to actually be with a nucleus and also other organelles, and we're going to see why they need other organelles. The reason why the sieve tube elements don't want organelles is because they want a continuous cytoplasm. No organelles to get in the way. Here, we do not see that, and this is going to be important in just a second. Now, like I said, companion cells are actually not involved in any direct, so there's no direct sugar conduction happening here, but they're still going to be considered sugar conducting cells for the following reason. So no direct sugar conduction cells, but what they do do is a critically important helping process. They are going to be moving sugar, not large distances, but they're going to be moving sugar into and out of those STEs, those sieve tube elements. For this reason, because they move things into and out of the sieve tube elements, they are also just co commonly known as the loading and unloading cells of the phloem. So they're going to input, in, uh, load the sugar and unload the sugar into the sieve tube element and allow the sieve tube element to really push the sugar, uh, dissolve sugar throughout the cell over long distances. Now, back to the organelle story. Why do they have organelles? Why don't they have the same mimic structure, let's say, of no nucleus mitosome, mitochondria and ribosome? This is because they actually have to work against a concentration gradient. So they have to work against a concentration gradient. A lot of the times what's going to happen is you're going to have sugar, right? And you want to immediately move the sugar out. And you don't want to wait for the sugar to build up into large concentrations so that it naturally moves. So you have to move against the concentration gradient. And if you want to move against any concentration gradient, we know that's a law of biology that requires metabolic energy. So it needs MET energy. How do you get that? Well, you have lots of mitochondria. Thus, you need lots of nuclei because those nuclei will provide the genes necessary to create the mitochondria, or not to create the mitochondria, but to, to give you the necessary components, uh, to give you the metabolic energy necessary, like the enzymes, the cofactors, all of the things necessary for metabolic energy to be made and then used to defeat the concentration gradient in order to load and unload sugar into sieve tube elements so that they can themselves continuously transport sugar over long distances. So that covers our sieve tube elements and companion cells. But one sort of thing I just want to add on very quickly is the fact that this continuous cytoplasm is aided by the fact that you have these structures known as plasmodesmata. Plasmodesmata. They're going to be a part of this idea here because what they are, plasmodesmata, are cytoplasmic extensions. Cytoplasmic extensions between, so they're again mediators. I like to think of them as companion cells plus sieve tube elements. So because they're right next to each other, sieve tube elements and companion cells, there's actually going to be a little bit of space that needs to connect them completely. And that connection is via the plasmodesmata, that connection between companion cells and sieve tube elements. This is basically going to be a nice mediator for which molecules, like sugars, and other ions, let's say, are going to move through. 
and once they move through the plasma desmata, um, it's a very nice transition into the sieve tube elements or out of the sieve tube elements, depending on whether you want to unload or unload. And finally, plasma desmata are very nice because they're actually so small that organelles themselves, because remember, right next to a sieve tube element is a companion cell, and a companion cell has all these organelles, especially a lot of mitochondria, what prevents the mitochondria from being loaded onto the sieve tube element? That's because the plasma desmata does not allow organelles to move through. Organelles can't move through. So basically what you have is this uh, loading and unloading that has to go through the plasma desmata, and then from there it has to go into the sieve tube elements. And that's our overall look at sugar conducting cells of the phloem. And that concludes our look at plant cells, the differentiated types of cells within plants as a whole.